Good afternoon. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive. This is Monday, February 13th, and we welcome you to our Westchester Weekly Update, where we're going to cover some of the issues that are at hand in Westchester County. We expect a short report today. I'll be joined in a little while by Deputy County Executive Ken Jenkins, uh, but uh, the issues that we have to cover will not take us too long, so we appreciate you tuning in and uh, getting your weekly update. The first thing we want to report on, we don't do this every uh, week, is where we are with the COVID infection, and the news has been particularly good good. As we make our way through uh, the month of February, the numbers in COVID across the board are dropping. We have a grid that we're showing you on the screen, and it compares where we were for February 12th, yesterday, with where we were uh, a, a month ago uh, in January, January 12th. It may say June on this document, but it's January, and then December 12th, those three months uh, to give you an idea of, of the progress we've had. We have 1,080 active cases of COVID right now. That's the lowest number we've had in, a, in quite a long time. And uh, the numbers have been dropping in a fashion where I believe we'll be under 1,000 active cases sometime later this week. That is a very good sign. We also have 118 people hospitalized. That number is down dramatically over where it's been over the last few months. You'll see the January number in the middle column was 249 a month ago, uh, a little lower than that in December 208. So it went up a little bit uh, after the holiday season, and now it's dropped down to uh, less than half of what it was uh, just a month ago. We've had five fatalities over the last seven days, and that compares uh, with, as a smaller number than what we've had over the past two months. Uh, every fatality is a tragedy. We never want to minimize or turn into a statistic a human life. Uh, we look for as few fatalities approaching zero as possible, and uh, we'd like to see that number zero. And then we also provided an infection rate. This is a rounded off number. Out of every 100 people tested for COVID, how many of them tested positive? The current uh, number over the last three days averaged out is about 5%. So five out of every 100 people have tested positive for COVID. 95% of the people have tested negative. That number in the last couple of uh, periods of time, a month ago and two months ago, uh, was almost double at 9%, 8.5% the month before that. So the overall assessment is that the numbers are looking better. We have less people hospitalized. We have less people getting the disease. We have a lower infection rate. And uh, I think, obviously, the, the fact that we are well vaccinated in this county, many people now have taken advantage of the bivalent vaccination, that that puts us in a much better situation. We are approaching, over the next couple of months, a date, I think it's May 11th, as I understand, in which the federal government is going to cease uh, treating this as an emergency, and that will reduce uh, federal resources toward providing free vaccinations and what have you. We haven't yet established what our county policies will be in this area. We have some vaccination efforts that are going on. We'll mention a couple of them in a few minutes, but um, we'll keep you well posted. And there's so many different places you can be vaccinated now. There's so many different places that you can uh, uh, find testing now that we're not particularly concerned about all, all of that is, uh, is, is affecting our numbers as our numbers continue to drop. We want to highlight uh, as part of all of this that uh, the, the, the costs of uh, testing and the cost of vaccination, if it is no longer borne by the federal government, we expect will be part of those who have uh, insurance, uh, personal insurance through their business or in other fashions, and that would uh, handle a portion of it so that the county and, to that matter, the state and the federal government would be providing this type of assistance continuing for those who are indigent. But we'll see how that plays out in the weeks to come. The basic good news on COVID, we don't report on it every week, but the basic good news is that the numbers are down, and uh, we're reasonably optimistic that if it stays down for this period of time, then we'll move into a, a very helpful portion of the year where COVID is with us, but it is not the centralizing, organizing uh, reality that it was. We're approaching the three-year anniversary just in a couple of weeks of the first cases being documented here uh, in New York, and so we're very hopeful hopeful that this will be um, a d diminution that will stay over the course of the spring and the summertime, bearing, uh, barring any variants that might yet come. But we'll track this as we go along, and we'll be happy to keep you posted. <coughs> now, we do have some off-site clinics coming up with vaccinations. Uh, Wednesday, February 15th, which is just two days from now, we will be at the Yonkers Riverfront Library down on Larkin Plaza uh, from 3 to 6.30 p.m., uh, and then the following day, we'll be in Levister Towers, uh, which is uh, part of the major housing complex on the south side of Mount Vernon off of 3rd Street, 70 West 3rd Street to be specific, also from 3 to 6. And then we will repeat both of those two locations before the end of February. We'll return to Riverfront Library on Thursday, the 23rd of February, 4.30 to 
27, a little later uh, on both days. And then on Friday, February 24th, we return to Levister Towers Complex from 1 to 4 in the afternoon. And all of those uh, areas, we try to reach out to the urban centers of the county, and we spread them around the county in other different ways. Um, I want to highlight as we move from COVID to uh, probably the larger governmental issue. It's still a bit of an inside baseball issue for where we stand now. Most people are not focused on, on what's happening uh, in Albany, but the new legislative session year for Albany is underway. Uh, the governor gave uh, the state of the state message and is followed by delivering the state budget. And we have met as a county government executive branch with the county board of legislators and our state legislators, the people that were elected last November to serve in assembly seats and, and state senate seats representing portions of Westchester County, all or part of Westchester County. And we're very fortunate to have a good dialogue with those state legislators. And we've gone over a couple of issues that affect the county government and therefore the people of Westchester County uh, as having some import. Where we stand now in the state budget process, the state legislators you know, will certainly explain this. I had my opportunity to serve in the state legislature for 13 years. Is we uh, now will be going within the next uh, couple of weeks to a 30 day period in which the governor can submit modifications to the budget that she submitted on February 1st. Then those modifications will go through final review by the legislature. Each of the two houses will develop their own budgets, modifications to the governor's budget, and then they'll negotiate out those two differences uh, and then come back with the budget that they will then discuss with the governor. If all goes well, it's an April 1st uh, deadline and it will meet the deadline on that date. We have generally not had significantly late budgets over the last uh, 15 or so years. There was a period of time dating back prior to that when we had the routinely late budgets, and in some cases, very late budgets. The last very long budget we had that delayed was in 2010. Uh, so that's uh, hopefully a sign that we can negotiate out. But there are some thorny issues here, and they, they range across a number of different areas. From a county government area, we've identified a couple of areas that, that we are working with our state legislators to make sure they understand what the impact of the state budget is on county finances and thereby how it affects the people of Westchester County. <coughs> Excuse me. The first uh, thing to mention is that this budget establishes higher rates of compensation for those lawyers that defend indigent individuals in uh, uh, criminal cases. That is usually done uh, through a program, a section of law 18B, which is where those lawyers uh, operate out of, and it's the county's responsibility to compensate those lawyers. There was a lawsuit in New York City recently in which a court decided, and I think rightfully so, that the lawyers were being paid well below market rate for legal uh, work and that they needed to raise up the amount of compensation for those lawyers. If they're going to defend their clients uh, effectively, give them proper representation, they need to be compensated, not necessarily at the same level that you might have uh, in the private sector, but certainly better than what has been done before. Uh, this budget, the governor has established rates that would apply to the rest of New York State, not uh, covered by the lawsuit that was adjudicated just for New York City alone. But the impact of the rates that the governor has put in her budget will be a cost to Westchester County of $11 million annualized over the course of a year. Now, we don't know exactly how it will be implemented, and there may not be a full year impact. There's things yet to be determined. But an $11 million addition to the county budget, particularly when our budget has been closed. We completed our budget at the end of December and certified it. It's now in effect for this year, and it is a closed entity. We now have to deal with changes that happen from outside, but not decisions we make on the inside. Uh, the additional $11 million in this case, if we turned it into a property tax uh, impact, would be a 2% increase in property taxes just for this one decision alone. So we've gone to our state legislators, we've communicated with the governor's people what the impact is, and it's not just the impact on Westchester County, this is Putnam County, Dutchess County, Orange County, all across the state, all the way out to Erie County, all the way up to Clinton and Franklin County in the northern tier of New York State and the island as well. So we'll see how that issue is resolved in the state budget. The next issue, which is even more impactful, is not part of the state budget, but is a decision made by the state uh, division of the budget to hold back money that the federal government has given to the state of New York to reimburse for uh, enhanced federal Medicaid uh, program resources. And, and holding all of that money at the state level instead of returning some of it to the counties to offset costs that we've had has a negative impact to Westchester County of 29 million dollars. Now that number is much higher than the one I just shared with you. If the first number represents a 2% property tax increase, then this number represents a more significant increase, 4% potentially in and of itself. Uh, so we're concerned about the separate 
uh, situation. And it's not part of the budget. It is a decision made by the division of the budget. And so we've gone to our state legislators and said this needs to be negotiated because our county governments cannot accept the hit of that size and scope along with the earlier issue and still be able to properly provide the services we do at the level of taxation that we've done. Uh, there's a proposal in this budget to increase the uh, uh, MTA, Metropolitan Transit Authority, mobility tax. This was imposed as a tax on all businesses back in 2009 at, at a level of uh, uh, 0.34. Now it's being raised by 50% to 0.51. The impact to Westchester County as an employer is about a million dollar impact over the course of the year, but it affects all employers that are private sector employees. Uh, it also affects municipal governments who, like the county government, are not exempted from having to pay the payroll tax. The only entity that, was, that has been exempted are school districts. School districts do not have to pay this tax, but nonprofits do, local governments do, county governments do, and businesses do. And that is going to be an issue to be dealt with uh, in the state budget. The final thing I want to mention has probably gotten the most amount of attention, and that is the programs that have been offered to uh, increase housing across New York State. And there's multiple elements to this, and we've been very judicious as a county government in reading through first the language and determining what the impacts are. There are three basic elements that are significant in the housing program. The first one is to establish a goal of trying to raise the total number of housing units by 3% in every one of the uh, communities in New York State. Uh, in the downstate region, 3%. In the upstate region, 1% increase in the number of units. In Westchester County, we have 45 municipalities. We are in the MTA region, which is how they divided downstate from upstate. The 3% goal would be based on the number of housing units we had as of the 2020 census, and we would have to reach that goal by the end of 2026. So in that period of time, there has to be a 3% growth. We've had many communities in Westchester County that have already developed sufficient number of units since the 2020 census, New Rochelle, Yonkers, White Plains, Port Chester, uh, Tarrytown, and there are others as well. So the meeting of the goal is something that has already happened in a number of communities. Uh, the governor has, has included this as a means of trying to satisfy uh, the growth for additional housing units in general. There are some communities that have not reached this goal, and, and the county does not have a direct role in implementing the program, but we try to be a partner government. And so as we look at this, uh, we're, we're dialoguing with the state for how that might happen. We have a goal of trying to help create affordable housing, not just market rate housing. Uh, Westchester has a high market rate uh, desirability. It's much harder to develop affordable housing in Westchester because of that reality. The demand for an open piece of land is very great because the private sector can build on that land, charge market rates, and make quite a bit of profit. Uh, that land that isn't available for us to do an affordable housing project on. <coughs> But in the, in the macro picture of things, this is one of the issues the governor is working on. Another issue is transit-oriented development and changing the zoning laws within a certain radius around each of the different, for Westchester County purposes, Metro North rail stations. We have uh, a round number of about 44, 45 Metro North stations of some size or another in Westchester County. That's the Harlem Line, Hudson Line, and the New Haven Line. We actually, if you read the law specifically, we're actually within the range of the two uh, railheads of two of the New York City subway systems, the Dyer Avenue subway and the 241st Street subway, both come within a certain parameter of the city of Mount Vernon. But primarily, this, is, this transit-oriented development is targeted toward communities that have a rail station and then trying to change the zoning to make it uh, uh, more amenable for more dense uh, uh, development around the, the train station, multifamily units in that situation. Many of the communities of Westchester County have already done that. And when you look at the, the housing around Tarrytown train station, certainly the housing around downtown White Plains train station and other places, that's exactly what you'll see because the demand in the marketplace is for housing that's proximate to the train. People can walk to the train, get on the train, go into the city. And in so doing, it's almost the equivalent of being in an outer borough of New York City going into Manhattan. The, the Metro North train takes you into Manhattan about the same time that the E or the F train takes you from Jamaica into Midtown Manhattan. But not every community has, has made that decision. And this uh, plan from the governor would impact the local government's ability to zone uh, to, to try to make sure that there is a higher level of density than perhaps already exists or that the community may want. 
I want to tie that to the other issue that's talked about, which is the creation of a state body that would uh, be able to override local zoning whenever a particular project has been out there and over some extended period of time. Uh, the developers of that project have been unable to get the local government to uh, accept or adopt uh, the program. This is seen as, a, uh, as an action of last resort, but it rightfully concerns people who know that out in the suburbs zoning is the tool that's being used to try to shape how each community is being developed. And every community has a different footprint. Every community has a different uh, sense of itself. We, we have various uh, mayors of villages, mayors of cities, and supervisors from towns come to this very podium to talk to you about Briarcliff Manor and Pelham Village and the city of uh, Yonkers and the, uh, and the town of Lewisboro and the town of Pound Ridge, and every one of them is different. I always talk about the diversity that exists in Westchester County. There is a perception, and I think we try to push back on this, that, that, that only the city wants growth and the suburbs want to keep people out. And, and that isn't accurate depending on the community you're talking about. Different communities have a different footprint and, and are, well, are ready to welcome additional units as their local decision making has been. So on the area of zoning, we've been very reticent to see zoning overridden. We think that is an important tool of local governments, and I, and I believe that if, if the goal is to try to create more housing units and more affordable housing units, we get a lot more of it with honey than we do with vinegar, and we do that in a cooperative way, not necessarily in a punitive way. But the budget has certain tools in it, and we'll see how that works through in the process. I share these things with you because they are not county decisions to be made, but they affect the county. And uh, you know, myself and my executive team, Ken Jenkins, uh, Joan McDonald, uh, uh, the rest of that team, is very focused on trying to, to frame out what these impacts are going to be for the county and then try to encourage through our state legislators and our direct conversation with uh, the governor and her staff what these impacts are. And this is happening not just in Westchester, but in Nassau and Suffolk and Rockland and Dutchess and the other counties as well. But what happens in the state budget will matter. And, and oftentimes, things that happen in county government and state government, where I've spent you know, the vast majority of my uh, governmental career, happen in a bit, of a, uh, a bit of a vacuum. Most people focus on, because of major media, what's happening in Washington. Or they focus on what's happening in their backyard, their school district, their local town or city or village. And what happens at the county level and the state level kind of fades to gray until something happens that they don't like. And then there's the reaction to it. So what we're trying to do is be thoughtful, stay ahead of the game, dialogue in an appropriate way with the decision makers at the state level, and try to impact policy as much as we can to benefit the people of Westchester County. Even if it's not our decision to make, we will have to uh, handle the financial impacts of those decisions and the societal impacts of those decisions. So that's uh, where we are right now at the state budget, and there's a host of other issues that we'll talk about. I'm going to ask uh, our Deputy County Executive Ken Jenkins to join me. There's a couple of things we want to just repeat, remind you about, and one of them, again, is the HERO program in which we're trying to assist those individuals who volunteer to serve in fire departments and EMS. Ken? Thanks, George. Um, and, and consistent with the, the philosophical view um, that the county executive has set, set forward for us in the county, we, Westchester County has renewed a very innovative tuition assistant and student loan repayment program to help our volunteer fire departments and EMS agencies recruit and retain more local talent. So about 132 volunteer first responders were awarded half a million dollars in 2022 after the Higher Education Recruitment and Retention Opportunity Program was launched, lovingly called HERO. Based on that success, um, the administration and the Board of Legislators approved the funding for the same amount in 2023, and we are all committed to doing what we can to support our local volunteer fire and EMS agencies to recruit and retain those members, consistent with County Executive um, just mentioned a minute ago with how the philosophical view has been to make sure that everyone has that seat at the table, including making additional um, items up as far as good neighbor policies, things that are not required by law, but make living and working in Westchester just a better place to do. This is another example of this. The county is committed to doing what they can and hoping to improve our volunteer ranks and providing active volunteer emergency service personnel with tuition reimbursement or student loan repayment assistance up to $6,000. To be eligible, a HERO applicant must be an active member of that volunteer fire department, a volunteer um, fire company, part of a volunteer fire district, or an EMS agency 
for at least one year. The applicant's department or agency will have to verify that these training and service requirements have been met. The HERO program is uh, administered by the Outstanding Department of Emergency <coughs> Services, led by um, Commissioner Richard Wishney and Deputy Commissioner Susan Spear. Those forms and more detailed information about the program's requirements and the approval process can be found online at westchestergov.com slash HERO, H-E-R-R-O. Thanks, George. Thanks, Ken. A couple more things, um, most of which we've heard about before, but uh, bear repeating. Uh, this is the month of February, Black History Month, and there have been a number of different events and activities all across Westchester County to recognize that. And we have, in, in various sequences, uh, months and weeks that honor the various ethnicities within Westchester County, of course, uh, across the state. Uh, we celebrated the uh, Asian uh, uh, Lunar New Year just a few weeks ago, which was a, a prime thing. We know that we're coming into the month of March, which is Women's History Month, and then also a celebration through St. Patrick's Day of the Irish-American experience here in Westchester County and in America. So this month, Black History Month, has been uh, a very prominent uh, element of, uh, of these various programs. I've attended some, Ken's attended some, in different parts of the county. Uh, we have an award ceremony coming up for Trailblazers. Ken is the MC of it, and it's, it's virtual, and it's sponsored by the uh, Westchester County African American Advisory Board. We're very appreciative of Barbara Edwards uh, and her leadership of that board, and the Trailblazers program uh, is really an exceptional program. They're gonna be honoring two individuals this year uh, who have uh, contributed greatly to the community. You'll be able to see it online Thursday, February 23rd at 6 p.m., and you can visit uh, our Westchester Gov website to get some of the information on it. Click on, as I said, you'll see my brother, Ken Jenkins. I have a few words to share in there, but it is, um, it has been uh, over a number of years an in-person event because of COVID. The last couple of years we've stayed into the virtual realm. We're in an interesting stage now. Some things are going in person, some things are still virtual. There are decisions being made event by event, but this, is a, this one I think will be worth your time to watch Thursday, uh, February 23rd at 6 p.m. on Facebook, and that's uh, our Black History Month celebration of the Trailblazers for the African American Advisory Board. I'm gonna go back to Ken, because he did this the last time. <laughs> Amazing butterflies in Lasden Park. Should be fun, Ken. <laughs> Thanks, George. And, and certainly this amazing butterfly exhibit um, that's at Lasden Park is produced by Minotaur Mazes of Seattle, and it's an immersive experience where it's going to be based on an opportunity where you get to be a beautiful butterfly at the end of going through this maze. So you're going to discover fascinating facts about our planet's most amazing life cycles, but beware, the maze includes dead ends down which lurk poisonous plants and predators waiting to pounce. If you choose the right route, you stamp your card along the way, you'll emerge as a beautiful butterfly. This is gonna be at Lasden from now until May 7th, and you can go to the Friends of Lasden Park um, at lasdenpark.org, or call 914-864-7268 for more amazing information. Thanks a lot, George. And let me just encourage everybody, this we, we've covered a couple of times in the past, but we encourage you to sign up for the My Westchester electronic newsletter. It's put out by our Cracker Jack communications team led by Catherine Chaffee, Carolyn Fortino, Joe Scamato. Uh, uh, we have a number of other people on that team that do terrific work. And the My Westchester uh, e-newsletter has all of these different events. It highlights things that are being done in the Parks Department, highlights when we have uh, our household uh, uh, chemical cleanup days and other types of things that, that are not uh, you know, necessarily deeply governmental, but they are uh, wonderful events, things that you can participate in and uh, get some benefit and value out of it. So My Westchester uh, is the name of the newsletter. You can go on to our website, westchestergov.com, and uh, there's a way for you to sign up for it. Give them your email address and you'll receive it, and then you'll be on top of these things uh, as they come along. You won't, you won't miss too many of them. So uh, we have a pretty short report for today. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, we will have uh, next week, Monday, as a federal holiday. It's President's Day, 
And so uh, we will be doing our report, uh, I presume, on Tuesday at the same time at 2 o'clock. Obviously, if there's anything that's of uh, higher importance, we'll uh, you know, make that information available to you to keep you posted. The county is in a, uh, a bit of a uh, beginning of the year slow period. We, we have got our budgetary issues behind us. The Board of Legislators is working on different legislative issues uh, as they start to mature. Uh, we'll see exactly where we stand in those things. Really, the focus now is at the state level of government because of the state budget and, and legislation. They have a defined period of time. They go out of session in, in June. So whatever doesn't happen by the end of June will be silent for the rest of the year, whereas the county legislature meets uh, every other week uh, throughout the course of the year. I do want to highlight one more thing which you should be aware of. Because of early voting and an early primary, we now have June primaries instead of September primaries, the political process starts much earlier in the year. A little later this month, the two weeks from tomorrow, the process of petitioning for various offices for the November election and this primaries that may occur in June will begin. So if you are a registered member of the Democratic, Republican, Conservative, Working Family Parties, or any other uh, existing uh, structure, there will be petition signatures that will start to qualify candidates for the various offices. This year, all 17 members of the Westchester County Board of Legislators will be on the ballot. You'll have uh, town supervisor, town council races in many of our towns. Uh, you'll have uh, in, uh, city races in some of the large cities of Westchester County. The mayoralties of New Rochelle, Yonkers, and Mount Vernon are all up for election this year. Um, also in Peekskill, mayoralty is at, is at hand. And then village elections, those that are November elections, and there are more of them now than have ever been before. A number of villages, most recently Hastings on Hudson and Larchmont uh, and Tuckahoe, have moved their village elections from March to November. So uh, while we have March elections in a few of the villages, more of them in November, which will mean a process of petitioning. And then also those candidates who are running for countywide judge positions or will be seeking uh, designation by their parties for the state Supreme Court at a convention in August, those petitions will be out there. So depending on your level of involvement in these things, um, it is, you know, it seems like the last election is just behind us, but the next election is at hand. And of course, because the nation really focuses on the presidential elections, people will say, well, 2023 is an off year. Well, it's not an off year if it's the people you select to run your town, run your city, or run your village. It's very much an on year for those individuals, and it's very much an on year to select those people that would come to the Westchester County Board of Legislators uh, to help make decisions on countywide policies as well as municipal policies. So I highlight that for you. We'll mention it again as we get a little bit closer to it, but we're just two weeks away from the beginning of the petitioning process, and uh, you'll, you'll read more about that and see more about that in the media. In the meantime, thank you for watching. On behalf of Ken Jenkins, Deputy County Executive, and myself, George Latimer, County Executive, thank you for watching. Have a good, safe week, and we'll be back with you next week.